this seminar, which focuses on local government and planning, is particularly timely given the Local Government Act passed in the Assembly in April of this year. Being the final piece of um, RPA legislation, it brings with it a significant time of change for Northern Ireland. Through the transfer of some functions to the newly structured local councils, this topic, of course, is of particular interest to the committee, as back in 2011, which was before my time in the committee, it's, it was also considered one of the largest pieces of legislation in the Assembly um, at that time, and it's obviously in, um, in the form of the Planning Act. Having provided the legislative basis for the organisation of councils, the transfer of planning and the introduction of community planning, the challenge now lies ahead for councils to effectively deliver these new rules and ensure local communities are given greater opportunities in shaping their areas. That being said, our work here is not finished. The committee faces an extensive suite of subordinate legislation with respect to the Local Government Bill. In October, the Department launched a consultation on the statutory planning partners for community planning. Identification of these partners will need to be made before April next year so that councils can ensure functional partnership working. The committee relies on evidence to help inform its decisions, therefore we're always interested to hear what research is telling us and how we can learn from examples to help assist our work. With this in mind, I look forward to introducing the presentations today, which clearly complement the current work of the committee. I would like to welcome all three speakers from the University of Ulster, Professor Colin Knox and Dr. Carl O'Connor from the School of Criminology, Politics and Social Policy, and Mr. Gavin Rafferty from the School of the Built Environment. Professor Colin Knox will begin proceedings by looking at the outworkings of community planning in local government and the relationships between partners, councils and central government. This will be followed by Mr. Gavin Rafferty, who will explore the interfaces between land use planning and community planning in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, with particular focus on the border area. Dr. Carl O'Connor will conclude today's presentations by considering and making of policy in new councils in terms of what guides decision making and the need for developed administrative capacity. So it's uh, for me now just to hand over to our speakers and I know you'll be looking forward to their presentations and the discussion afterwards and I hope you'll excuse me as I um, skedaddle back to my health committee which is um, another role I have within this um, assembly. So have a good day and again you're very welcome Parma Buildings. Okay so thank you very much Pamela and Susie for the introductions. Uh, as Pamela said, uh, I'm Colin Knox from the School of Criminology, Politics and Social Policy at Ulster University. And um, we've relatively short period of time today, so you're welcome and thank you for coming along at this busy time of the year. Because of a relatively short period of time, I've given in the briefing document a more comprehensive overview of the substance of what I'm going to talk about. But I thought it would be useful in the relatively short period of time that we had today to look at three things. First of all, uh, I'd like to look fairly briefly at community planning as a process. Secondly, um, the kind of key question that I've asked in looking at some of this work is how do we know or how will we know whether community planning is actually a successful venture? And the third thing that I thought might be opportune is from my perspective to look at what potential issues there, there are ahead of us as we embark upon the community planning journey. And some of these are speculative from my point of view, since clearly community planning won't happen until April of next year, at least in part anyway, given the decision by the Department for Social Development to remove at this point uh, community regeneration and uh, community development and urban regeneration. But a little bit more about that later. So, um, just before we get into the substance of community planning, I have to say I might as well get my own biases out first of all. I'm a huge fan of community planning. I think it offers major opportunities for local government. I think it may offers major opportunities for central government departments to work with local government. So I think uh, in some, I think it has a great potential to create integrated governance at the level of local authorities. I also think it offers the prospect of us finally getting what was called in the review of public administration strong local government, but didn't actually transpire or didn't translate into strong local government, given the relatively 
minor functions which local government inherited under the RPA. So I think community planning uh, offers that prospect of strengthening the role of local government within our overall governance system. I also think the recent announcement by the DOE minister, Minister Durkin, that uh, a partnership has been now been agreed between central, a partnership panel, as it's called, between central and local government will be a huge boost for local government. For the first time, if you like, they will hopefully have influence at the level of central government. So I think those are positive developments. And one way in which I think we could describe community planning, which is about integrated government, is it's equivalent to what delivering social change is trying to do at central government level. So if delivering social change is about integrated government at central government level, then community planning is about integrated government at the local government level. So just to the substance of what I would like to say today, <clears throat> so by way of context, what is community planning? And I suppose uh, one goes to the legislation to uh, define what is meant by community planning, and I have done exactly that. So this is how the Local Government Act, Northern Ireland 2014, defines community planning. It's a process by which the councils and its community planning partners identify long-term objectives for improving the social, economic and environmental well-being of the district and contributes to sustainable development in Northern Ireland. That's quite a big ask for an initiative like community planning. It's also about identifying actions to be performed and functions exercised by councils and its community planning partners. So it covers a wide range of activities here, social, economic, environmental well-being, and a contribution to sustainable development. So this is an ambitious agenda that we're asking from local government here. Before I go on to talk about the detail of that, I wanted to highlight at this stage what I would consider to be the four key stakeholders in the community planning process, in no order of importance. Clearly, the council will have a key role to play in local authorities in the, in the community planning process here. And the legislation dictates that the council must initiate, maintain, facilitate, and participate in community planning. And I think this is a massive ask for local government here, a body which would be seen to be relatively low in the pecking order of our governance system is now being asked to initiate maintain and facilitate this. And I think the response of some of our government departments, some of our community, statutory community planning partnerships will be partners, will be interesting in terms of how they react to that central role that local government is being given. So I think the council is, is the first stakeholder in this, as I say, not necessarily in any order of importance. I think um, the community planning partners themselves, and I'll talk about who potentially they might be in the moment in a moment legislation dictates that they and i quote must participate to the extent that such planning is connected with their functions and must assist council in the discharge of their duties my emphasis with the must uh, and i think uh, whilst this is part of the legislative remit one would have to ask the question how could that be enforced so if one of the community planning partners is seen to be less willing to participate, what actually happens in those circumstances and how will that be dealt with at the level of local authority, at local authorities themselves? I'm not suggesting at this moment that community planning partners are going into this in a negative frame of mind, but I think there could potentially be some issues around community planning partnerships' willingness to participate at a high level across 11 local authorities and indeed their capacity to do that. The third key stakeholder in all of this, I think, is government departments. The legislation suggests that in exercising any function that might affect community planning, the government departments should, I quote, promote and encourage community planning and have regard to any implications of community planning for the exercise of the department's functions. So in sum, the the role of the department here is seen as distinct but complementary to that of statutory partners. And the fourth and final stakeholder, key stakeholder in all of this, I think, is the community. 
as someone once described it, where is the community in community planning? And I think there is a role uh, for both the councils and statutory bodies. They must seek the participation of community, business, representative of voluntary sector bodies, and they must take their opinions into account in the formulation of the community plan. I think there's potentially some ambiguity about how they will do that. So I think the definitions here raise interesting questions, both about the scope of this exercise and about the potential role of partners therein. So let me move on fairly quickly to what is the process of community planning? What does, does it actually entail in practice? An important consideration here is obviously that there's some kind of overall goal, mission, mission statement uh, that a local authority develops in consultation with those stakeholders that I've just mentioned. But the emphasis from other jurisdictions is that the community plan actually ends up with a small number of high-level cross-cutting themes which require collaborative action across the community planning partners with an identified lead organisation. Now, the emphasis in all of that is small number and collaboration. So these are not things that people are doing anyway in the course of their individual functional responsibilities, but rather cross-cutting issues. And that's the value-added bit, I think, of community planning here. An action plan linked to those cross-cutting themes, a formal commitment to the community plan by partners through their own internal planning and decision-making processes. And I want to return to that, the alignment with individual departmental and community planning partners' priorities versus their uh, commitment to a community plan, which may cross-cut some of their vertical commitments. And the fourth stage is monitoring and evaluation of progress in meeting the targets and outputs outlined in the community plan itself. So in short, community planning is really about much more effective, I hate to use this word, but it's one that people understand, much more effective joined up services and, prov and it provides opportunities for greater involvement of communities or so the legislation tells us. I think to put it in a slightly different way, local authorities can become like the junction box for the locality, seeking to integrate and join up services for the benefit of all people and for the long-term sustainability of the area. So what makes for a good community plan if that's the process by which we undertake it or conduct it? Again, research from other jurisdictions gives us some signposts to what makes for a good community plan. And I've just described this as proofing, if you like, proofing some of our draft plans coming forward. So I think a good community plan will have high-level commitments to what we will do in those areas, and they must add value, as I mentioned, to the existing work of planning partners. So I think it will be a test of the sincerity, if you will, or good faith, if you will, of those statutory community plan planners if they arrive at a community planning table and simply reshuffle some of their existing commitments within their own departments or agencies. So typically, some of those high-level commitments would be around things like the economy, improved prosperity, health, education, community safety. So they're very much at that kind of top, top line. Uh, then, uh, a number of limited actions or a limited number of actions that make these plans truly collaborative. And I think those have to be realistic, they have to be achievable, they have to be time-bound, all of the kind of smart nomenclature that goes with planning. In other words, partners need to cooperate to make them happy. Cross-cutting, joined-up commitments. That's the, at the core of the community planning concept. They need to be measurable, they need to be associated with how they will actually do this in practice. And this, again, looking at other jurisdictions, it is often the case that community planning partnerships are told, and this is a nice euphemism, community planning plans should be budget neutral. In other words, there's no money for it, no additional money for it, but making better use of existing resources. And I think the ultimate test of community planning, and this is where I want to move to, 
The ultimate test of community planning is whether its implementation improves the quality of people's lives in a district council. In other words, uh, community planning is about improving the quality of people's lives through better public services. And I think that is an ambitious, a hugely ambitious agenda, but nonetheless a hugely worthwhile agenda. agenda. So the question that I'm now going to pose is, so how would we measure in the future if community planning impacts upon the quality of people's lives? If this is what we're saying it's about, how will we know if we've achieved it? And one of the things that I'd like to commend to, commend to you for those that are practitioners in this field is a set of quality of life indicators that were developed by the Audit Commission in England, and they termed them quality of life indicators and improving sustainable development. So without going through the detail of these, I can give you the website reference, it'll be on, it's in my policy brief. Um, what the Audit Commission did was they looked at what they considered to be the key facets of quality of life, what public services needed to be improved to improve the quality of people's lives. And they came up with 10 thematic areas with a limited number of performance measures therein. And the 10 areas they covered were people and place, community cohesion, community safety, culture and leisure, economic well-being, education, health and social well-being, environment, housing, transport and access. So they said using a, a, li a limited number of in indicators in a basket that they described as a basket of indicators that constitutes quality of life. So one of the things that I would commend to practitioners is the adaptation of those quality of life indicators. Why do we need to reinvent the wheel? Now clearly we're talking about different jurisdictions here and perhaps some of those ind indicators might include things around good relations, which might not be an issue to the same extent in other jurisdictions. But those, I, those indicators, I think, offer a, a, an opportunity for us to look at the potential impact across those thematic areas. The indicators themselves are few in number, up to 45. So you have 10 themes, four, four indicators within each of these themes, <clears throat> and those indicators are being asked to measure a lot, so we may well want to adapt them for the circumstances of Northern Ireland. The indicators are both a mix of hard data, uh, factual data, and uh, uh, data about people's attitudes and opinion to public services. The <clears throat> benefit of these indicators is that they allow for comparison across the Northern Ireland average for these quality of life indicators, but they would also allow for benchmarking one local authority against the other. And I think they offer the opportunity for individual government departments or community statutory partners to identify where they need to invest their energies across those 11 councils, because each of those councils will have different needs and priorities. So I think these indicators challenge us to move beyond the comfort zones of individual departmental targets. I think there's much greater transparency and accountability uh, around improving things that actually matter to the quality of people's lives. So I don't know if this is beginning to sound like a class because I'm going to refer you to a handout. I don't know if you are able to access the policy briefing document, but you'll see on page five of that document a summary, a hypothetical example which shows these quality of life indicators in practice. It's on page five. So on the left-hand column, you will see examples of the indicators, crime and community safety, housing, health and social well-being, education and lifelong learning, economic and social well-being. And you will see a measurement in each of the columns. The first, first column is X district council, who will measure themselves against each of those indicators. The second column is the Northern Ireland average for those indicators. And the third and fourth column says, is this local authority better or worse on these quality of life indicators? And 
The point is here that if you are worse than the Northern Ireland average, then that will focus the energies of those individual government departments or agencies to do something about that within the local authority area. That's a very simply cast example just by way of explanation, but you could extend this to allow benchmarking across the 11 local authority areas so that they will see how they sit vis-a-vis -vis each other. So it's just a very quick example of the potential for community planning and opportunities to assess whether it's actually impactful across each of the local authority areas, and indeed, if it's more impactful in one against the other. So just to uh, bring my input to a conclusion, give my colleagues a little bit of time to talk, I just want to raise some general issues at this stage around where community planning is going here. First of all, I think there is a real concern here amongst practitioners that I speak to about what exactly is the role of a local authority in terms of community planning. Is it first amongst equal primus inter pares? Will it gain the respect of community planning partners? Um, Will it, who will be around, and who will be around the table? As you will probably know, there's a consultation paper out at the moment from the Department of Environment that is suggesting who those statutory community planning partners are. Not too surprisingly, you get bodies in there like the Education and Library Boards, soon to be the Education Authority, Health and Social Care Trust, Public Health Agency, Health and Social Care Board, PSNI, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive, Fire and Rescue Services, Invest ANI, and the Tourist Board. So those are listed by the Department of Environment as potential statutory community planning partners. So my suggestion is that there needs to be a commitment by these uh, community planning partners to promote and encourage community planning at the highest level within their organisation. So there is no point in these bodies signing up to be statutory partners if they're going to a community planning table and cannot commit to actions through their organisations, whether it's a next steps agency, whether it's a non-departmental public body, whether it's a trust, there is no point in them sending people to those partnerships that can't make a commitment on behalf of their organisation. And I think that raises capacity issues about those organisations. So, Will they have the capacity to send senior people who can make those commitments to 11 community uh, planning partnership tables? Because if they don't, there's no point in going along there and saying, yes, I'm here because you know, I'm a third substitute for uh, the chief executive of uh, the Health and Social Care Board. And of course, I will have to take all these decisions back and we will, those will be considered within our board. That defeats the object, in my opinion, of what community planning is about. The second, I think, issue of concern here is what will be the commitment of those partners to promote and encourage community planning? And this links in to the third point here, which I think is particularly relevant around dual accountabilities. So when a community, a statutory community planning partner is sitting at the community planning table, where is their accountability to or to whom is their accountability? In other words, are they there to represent the Education and Library Board that they're employed by? And hence the vertical accountability through the Education and Library Board, through the Department of Education, through the Minister, to the Assembly and Executive? Or do they have the same level of horizontal accountability to the community planning partnership? Is there a precedent which takes one pri what, which priority do they work to? So, for instance, if a regional priority for the Education and Library Board is to close schools across the piece, and they're working in a community planning partnership like Fermanagh and Oma, whose uh, priority might be to actually keep schools open, how do those vertical and horizontal uh, lines of accountability align? Or is there an inbuilt conflict of interest in the way in which this process has been set up? Very quickly, what about the role of the voluntary and community uh, sectors in these? It's, there's lots of discussion 
in the documents, in the uh, most recent consultative document about the statutory community planning partners. And uh, there's in the legislation, there's a commitment to take account of their views. How, in practical terms, is that going to happen? You know, are you going to, local authorities have the option beyond the statutory players at that table to invite others that might help inform that process? So are these invitees going to be like second order people? Is it only people who can flex their budgetary power? Uh, are these the important people at the table? So, or, or are we play, paying lip service to the inclusion of the community voice and uh, community and voluntary sector involvement here? I think that is still a big question, and I know organisations have grappled with that on the way to where we have arrived at now. And I suppose, penultimately, just a few quick points. Sorry, guys. Um, this idea that community can planning can be cost neutral my question is, is that realistic given what we're expecting from community planning and given the pressures on existing budgets that they're trying to uh, deal with all of these austerity uh, measures within their own organisations, whether it's an agency, whether it's a department, and now they're expected to make, if you like, cross-cutting commitments to a new partnership without any additional funding. I think that begs a significant question. And two very quick points I want to make to conclude. I think the issue of co-terminosity continues to haunt us throughout this process. We all know that the review of public administration was about trying to create co-terminous boundaries. For many reasons that I don't have time to go into here, that has not happened. My question is, how can community statutory planners sit at a table planning community uh, well-being if their boundaries are quite different or distinct from the local authority within which they are partners to that process. And the final, final point I want to make, maybe one more, uh, is I think the delay for probably, I say probably because I'm not sure, probably good reasons of the transfer of urban regeneration and community development to, Nick, to, to transfer those powers to local authorities not until 2016 has been a most unhelpful development. I'm not saying it was intentional, but it's been most unhelpful since I think those functions will be a key and integral part of making community planning work from the inception of the new councils one year prior to that, so April 2015. So just to conclude, I think... Community planning is about councils working with statutory bodies, the wider community, to promote well-being in the area and to improve the quality of people's lives. I think it has massive potential here. I think it readdresses the imbalance between central and local government relations that have predominated our governance system here for years. And I really do hope that we're set in place here a mechanism for that to happen. So thank you.